Eric soon meet our guest of honor, Philippe, who we are so happy that you made the effort to come from Switzerland for this evening with your family. Uh, your name came up several times that uh, we wanted to invite you, and then finally it worked out. So we're extremely happy to, to have you tonight. We are here and see a successful man like Philippe, who succeeded in so many things in his life, look up for his example and find out how he did it. All right? That's your chance to ask him personally that. So after we talk a little bit together, there will be microphones in the room, and you are invited to ask the questions that you want. I will ask each one to say his name before you ask your questions, and Philippe will take care of it. So, Philippe, welcome. We're very, very, very proud to have you, and thank you so much. Thank you so much. It means a lot for us that you came here. Thank you. Fadal. So obviously, Philippe is a graduate from Jamhur, Promo 1977. And I'm really interested to know, Philippe, when you were a kid in Jamhur. Every one of us had some dreams. I want to be a doctor, I want to be an engineer, a lawyer, etc. What were you dreaming about at that time? Uh, when I was in Jamhur, I was in the C1, so the Latin section. And out of the 31 students, 25 went to become the doctors. <laughs> and uh, half of them are uh, in America and in Canada and in France, uh, maybe 20% in Lebanon. And then three wanted to become lawyers, like their parents. And uh, one became, uh, worked for a publicity company, an advertising, and I was the only one who wanted to go in finance. People said, finance, what is this? I said, oh, dealing with other people's <laughs> money. <laughs> so people had no clue what it was. So I said, OK, I have a good chance if no one knows anything about it. I have very little competition. So at the time, that was, uh, it was an early dream. Very great, great. So, so but you finished in 77. And the war was raging already in Lebanon. And I imagine when we were in second or troisième, we were having those dreams about Lebanon being an incredible country. And in two years, you see Lebanon on fire. I mean, things that we never imagined could happen uh, were happening at that time. How did you change your way of thinking about your future when you were still a kid in school and it was dangerous to go to school or gone back home? And I mean, our life changed completely in, in a few weeks? Uh, I think it was a disaster for all of us, even more for our uh, parents than for us. Because, uh, I mean, today, when I go to Lebanon, people tell me, how is Lebanon? I tell them, Lebanon is great now. I say, what do you mean it's great? I say, but you haven't lived what we lived in 75, 78. Uh, I mean, it was a disaster, and we were living day by day. I mean, there was a year in 76 where we couldn't go to Jamhur, we couldn't go to Beirut, so we created a Jamhur in Big Faya. So there was a Jamhur Big, Big Faya. The year after, there was a AUB, or two years after, there was a AUB, we were AUB Zahrat al Ihsan. I mean, it was, we were constantly going left, right, and center because we couldn't go where we were meant to go. So um, we juggled with all this, and we didn't care about the long term. We were living day by day. But I just want to start with something. It's an honor for me to be here. Thank you very much for uh, coming. Uh, I mean, thank you very much for Gabby and Nada. And uh, I am uh, very honored to be a guest speaker. So thank you we for are. putting me on this chair. <laughs> so listening to this, it looks like, and I, I think many identify to what Philippe is talking about, is that the war had an impact on who we are today. Yes. No, I mean, I feel it today at my age that it did have an impact of maybe enhancing our resilience. Like, we, we, we were like, not caring about what's going on, we're going to do what we want to do, that kind of things. I mean, did you feel? I think the key for the success for most of us here is the resiliency. You know, take away the emotions of whatever happened in your job 
And uh, we all have jobs very volatile. We can miss an operation. We can miss uh, a building. I mean, a building, no, but uh, uh, we can miss a lot of things in our life. But it's important to continue to keep the course. And the war very early on taught us to be probably younger. I mean, we all lost young years. Uh, I mean, uh, des années d'insouciance, as we would say in French. Uh, because we had to deal with more important matters. So, I don't know, in 76, we left Lebanon in boats. We, we had some goats next, next to us in March 76. I mean, it was a disaster at the time. And somehow we came back. Somehow we overcame. Somehow nothing was bad enough. I mean, only maybe death was the worst thing that could happen. But if you were still alive, then you continue. And probably that's uh, what uh, something that we deal, uh, all of us deal, uh, had, had to deal with. But uh, I think the new generation among here are very lucky because they are abroad, they're exposed to good university. In our years, a good university was during your master degree. When I did my MBA at Columbia, I mean, it was, we were two or three Lebanese, but it was quite rare. People didn't know where is Colombia. I was told, why do you go to South uh, America? I, mean, uh, <laughs> I didn't know what to answer. I mean, uh, it was a relative of mine. I mean, it was not somebody coming from uh, So uh, we, today, I mean, our kids went to the best universities. They're exposed. They have much more tools to succeed. It's as hard, but they have more tools. And I think that's something that uh, is the benefit of the war. It pushed us to go abroad and to stick and to learn the best way to, to evolve. I would wonder whether, of course, what you say, I agree with you, because we have kids, same thing as you. Uh, but sometimes I feel that maybe what we went through made us tougher and more eager to work harder and maybe more appreciative of so many things and why a lot of things are taken for granted today. And uh, yes, the question is, look at it from a different angle. Uh, we very early on had to deal with things we should never have been confronted to. And so uh, all of us, I mean, I can see a lot of people here, and we all went differently through different things that uh, we were not meant at our age, at our period of our life, during that specific period to deal with. Whether you were a doctor, whether you were a student, whether you were a mother, whether you were a father, I mean, any, in any jobs, uh, or whether you were a kid. So I think that exposure made us very resilient. We are not allowed to fail, because where do we go if we fail? We want to go back to Lebanon, it's fine, we can go back, but then what do we do? There's, the only thing we can get is our education and benefit from it. So that concept of not allowed to fail make us work harder, succeed harder, be there when others are not there. And uh, I think uh, in my work, it's quite a volatile business to manage money, to buy stocks. Uh, I, I tell uh, investors, look, don't look at the up and downs. Let me deal with the up, up, with the up and downs. It's, it's hard enough. Don't read, don't read the press, don't watch TV, you know, it will panic you. You know, China is going to collapse, this is going to collapse, America is collapsing, uh, inflation is coming to, I mean, there is nothing. The period is good, it's fine, but let the professional worry and come back after three years. I think what it taught us is to look beyond the immediate events and not to have to be affected by the immediate event, uh, to always take it with a pinch of salt, you know, to be uh, yeah, careful yeah, yeah. a little bit. Philippe, I know that not everybody knows more or less the path of your studies and your career. Can you quickly, just for the audience yes. who doesn't know your history, you know, what did you do from when you left the school, what studies and how you, you came up with your career yes. to be who you are today? Yes, uh, in Jamhur, I was an average student. I mean, there we, were- We, we love the average student here. Yes. Uh, there was, <laughs> There was brilliant, brilliant students who went to Saint, to Saint Genevieve, to Polytechnique, uh, to do medical school. We were the average students because the average students picked up the courses that they liked, did well, and in the courses that they didn't like, they were okay. So we couldn't get straight A's. 
So uh, Jamur 77 went to France, like a lot of people for the last two years, 76, 77. Uh, then uh, tried to go to AUB for a year, and then was in that uh, Ashrafiye section of AUB. So it was not, uh, it was not safe in these days to go to the west part of Beirut. Uh, so we couldn't, so I went to Canada, to Montreal, uh, did the uh, BA uh, in economics at uh, Concordia University. Managed to get an honor, I don't know how, but probably I had <laughs> nothing else to do but to study. Uh, like all of us, I think, when you were in Lebanon, you had more this uh, traction than when you, uh, when you traveled. And then I managed to go to my uh, MBA at Columbia. I was age 20, I don't think they ever had a younger uh, student at that time. So I graduated, it uh, was in 1982, I was 22. And I wanted to do in finance, I wanted to go. I mean, it was very early stages, no one wanted to do, no one understood what was finance. My first job was in France, and there was foreign exchange controls. I don't know if anyone remembers what's a foreign exchange control. Meaning when you go to London, you're allowed to take 50 pounds, the equivalent, for a three day stay. So you had to find an hotel for 10 pounds, and you had a carnet uh, a little carnet of, uh, of uh, devises, you know, whatever. I mean, you were not allowed, things were really tough, not only in Lebanon, I mean, everywhere. And we were coming from New York with our big ideas, and somehow uh, interest rates were at 15%, there was a devaluation every now and then in France, in Spain, in Greece. So today, you don't realize, but it's a paradise for, pe for people like us. You have one currency, the euro, uh, the dollar, Euro for Europe, you have an uh, interest rate at zero. I mean, uh, America is a great place, uh, economically sp speaking. I mean, okay, you could like Obama, you don't like Obama, that's a personal problem, but as an economy, <laughs> as an economy, the stock market trebled, uh, interest rates are at zero, in inflation is very low, uh, unemployment is at 5%, uh, you all have savings which are working, your banks will not default. I mean, it's an extraordinary period. We will remember later on that maybe the best years of an economy is when uh, the problems you're dealing are more personal problems, whether you like whether Donald Trump has uh, to pee or not. I mean, those are, <laughs> when we are in Europe, we, we look at this, we say we don't understand. But uh, I mean, those are important problems because it's a philosophy of work. You could have more growth, you could have less growth, you could have, but I mean, the world has evolved a lot. And uh, all of us have probably uh, evolved with that world and try to benefit whether you deal uh, in housing, whether you deal in uh, technology. I mean, today, I mean, when I go to the board of, uh, I'm a member of the board of uh, AUB, even though I spent only one year there, even though three months or four months, and today, the big jobs, if you, it used to be the doctors, it used to be the lawyers, now it's more the tech people. I mean, a lot of people do uh, create WhatsApp, they get jobs at Google, they, they evolve, they uh, have the uh, application. I mean, there is, the whole world has changed, the internet, the technology is, is a real uh, revolution. And I think uh, all of us have evolved with that revolution uh, in a way. When you go to university today, 30 years ago, you had probably 10 avenues of job. Today, you have like uh, 100 when you go to university, the specialization. So I think it's an opportunity for a lot of people to go deeper. So anyway, uh, I worked in France. I worked in London 20 years in a big bank, then uh, in an investment bank, Lehman Brothers. Then we span off, we created the hedge funds for uh, 10 years. And then from that hedge fund, I started my own practice in Geneva nine years ago. And uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's how what so I've been doing what I do in, for the past 35 years, 32 years. So, so Philippe will not probably say it himself, but and I, I'm not an expert in finance, as everybody knows here. But I know that you have won many, many prizes. You've been named for the best hedge fund many, many times. At the same time, if somebody looks up Philippe, you will find some articles saying that Philippe's career is over and he's done, et cetera, and certainly he always managed to come back. And that's an incredible trait in you, Philippe. I mean, you, you've had situations where 
yes. things happened really badly, and then you came back even stronger. And and during the inflation, you did better than anybody else. So in the, the, the crisis of 2008, yes. sorry. In fact, the best years I had, where I won the best fund of the year in Europe, was in 2009, the year after the crisis. In 2013, the year after the European crisis, uh, in nine, uh, I mean, I had uh, extraordinary return. But the thing was that during the year before, when things were really falling off, we were we had difficulties, like every a lot of people in our business. But somehow, you take and you're able to differentiate between what's really bad from uh, what's uh, <coughs> what's important. So to identify that the opportunity has changed and not to panic too much. But that's probably a nature, or a human nature, not to be too stressed. Or if you are stressed, to keep it uh, very hidden. And I also had some period where you're doing very well, but then you have difficulties with your partners, so you somehow have to deal and create new opportunities. So managing other people's money is probably a very difficult uh, job, which we have survived over the years. And the key is because you like doing it, you know. It's not uh, a lot of people in our business have retired in my age. I mean, I lost probably when I dealt with a firm, with an investment bank that covers me. I'm probably at the sixth generation of sales coverage. You know, every four or five years, there is a new generation. And uh, it's very uh, interesting to have to deal. And uh, uh, so, I mean, it's like when you're a doctor and you deal with the nurses. Probably the nurses, they get... Uh, they don't stay all along with you. Some of them retire, and you get the new one. And it's the same thing, I think. So yes, we, it was, over the years, very difficult. But the difficulty were followed by great periods. And uh, it's very, uh, and what really helps you is really to be unemotional, work very hard. For the young people here who think that they've worked very hard to reach where you are, you haven't seen uh, anything. It gets worse. <laughs> It gets worse. I mean, you, you, 20 hours a day is, for a few of us, is very common. Uh, the weekends, uh, you try to get a life, but the rest of the week is, uh, doesn't really, you don't get a lot of uh, free time. But that's the price to pay, because uh, you have always to stay ahead of the game, I think. Uh, tell us about maybe the worst moment of your life where you were completely down, how, how, how mentally were you able to deal with having a really difficult situation? What were, your, what were you putting in your strengths, inner strengths? There were two difficult periods. It's when we had to leave Lebanon in 1976 because of the war. It was the end of the world and arriving in Paris. A bit like the refugees now who leave Syria. We were a bit similar. Uh, maybe we speak French, but that was a film, the, the only thing we had better than the refugees now. Uh, and uh, probably in my career, probably when uh, also during a period where I had uh, probably a lot of uh, adverse uh, situation, where I had a lot of uh, uh, a situation where people really go against you and uh, try to think you're too strong, you're too powerful. So in both situations, you have to deal with things. I mean, in the first one, you're very young. So you're protected, but you have to deal internally. In the other one, you have to take your strengths. And somehow, things come back. I mean, when I left Lebanon in 76, we left that, uh, probably you want me to talk about that property. I left, we left that summer house. Uh, and, uh, okay. and then the Syrian army took it the next. I have to say that whomever knows Bologna or Mtain, knows the Villa Jabr. And the Villa Jabr eventually was more associated to the Syrian army than to the Jabr family. And they basically took that house for like 28 years. 28 years, longer 20, than 28 our years. family. 28 yes. years. And everybody knows what they do when they take a house. They don't enhance the house, actually. They do the opposite. <laughs> <clears throat> the... and, and then in the meantime, in the meantime, when when it started, we were, we were young kid, probably, or, and then by now, there are how many, you know, my family members who have, who own part of this house, so it becomes impossible to go to Beirut. Many houses are not being repaired because now they are owned by 50 or 60 or 70 people, and they don't agree together. 
So Philippe has an incredible story, which was actually in the Wall Street Journal, about this house, and it would be great that you share it. Uh, so you get kicked out, and your dream is always to come back. I mean, I'm sure you all share these things. You understand what I mean. And so we got kicked out, and I wanted to come back. And the Syrian Secret Service were very happy in that house. So it was very hard to get rid of them. So, but first, it was, we had to deal internally with the family. They were so dis, disgusted by the occupation. The, I mean, one day, I'll tell a very joke, is that the Syrian army sent the Lebanese guy to my father. He wanted money for a door. He said, what do you mean a door? He said, yes, we want an iron door. He said, why do you need a steel door? My father couldn't understand. He said, for the jail. He said, you want me to pay you money for the jail of the house? Go, leave me alone. And the next day, they went and they cut 20 trees, you know, pine trees, that are as a punishment, because we didn't give them the 1,000 Lebanese pounds for the door. I mean, the parents had to deal with this uh, uh, primitive, uh, anarchist uh, thinking of the occupant. So anyway, I managed from the despair of the family to take control of the house. And I went to the Syrian and said, OK, now do you leave? He said, no, 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 never. Uh, OK, how much? No, no, never. You don't understand. Da, da, da. Two years later, they were gone, and uh, due to the news that we know. And I think the idea was to rebuild these places in memory of the people who were uh, uh, before me. I think I had a famous, a very good French friend. He said, Philippe, don't do anything with the house. Wait, wait. He had his grandparents had a house in Bordeaux. And it was a guest, the Gestapo had the quarters. So after the war, his parents sold the house. They thought it was a disaster. He said it was a disaster because we could never get the house back. Everyone forgot the Gestapo is there, but we lost our property that we had for 300 years. So I think that's more important. Today, nobody will remember that the Syrians were there, but that the Jabs are back, and that uh, it's a family own. Uh, and uh, so the, this is what probably the, what the, the Wall Street Journal liked, is the resiliency. I mean, 28 years, and my father said, but why do you want this? I said, that's OK. The Russians stayed in Berlin 50 years. We will wait. If by age 80, they're still the Syrians in the property, then we would have tried. And a few years later, they were gone. So I think it's what, this is what probably Gabi wanted to, uh, me to express, is the resiliency. Look ahead. Don't look through the years. Uh, somehow, things will come back if you work hard and if you're lucky. And in Lebanon, I think we are lucky that we were able to come back, that we're able to have a property, that we're able to go to Jamhur and to help Jamhur, to help AUB, to help the USG. I think. Uh... So there is, there is a, a huge part of who Philippe is, uh, and it's not spoken about a lot because I, I, I know from who Philippe is, and a number of friends in this room, actually, who are incredibly generous and great philanthropists. I mean, really great philanthropists. They don't talk about it, and they are always very discreet about it. But Philippe has created an incredible foundation that helps hundreds and hundreds, actually thousands of people in various fields. You want to tell us what pushed you to do that, and what does philanthropy bring to you as a person and your family? Uh, philanthropy brings to me what Winston Churchill uh, said. So thank you, Nada, for the sentence. It's not who you were, it's who, what you make out of it. Uh, I think uh, when I was at school, when I was at university, I, all I wanted, like long student, is for time to pass by because I wanted real life to start. I was uh, always very uh, in a rush. But once you leave this school, this university, you realize how uh, important it was. If most of us are here today, it's thanks to that uh, education. So Lebanon uh, is a great place for education. Uh, we're grateful. And so in my, uh, when I started to work, there used to be the Hariri uh, scholarship. And he used to give hundreds of scholarships. Then when he became prime minister, he stopped giving to uh, Christians. So I was very surprised. So that created. Uh, one day, I met the Hariri guy. I said, why did you stop giving to Christians? He said, oh, but your religious uh, authorities told us that we're pushing Christians for uh, emigration. So we should not. Uh, I mean, when you do politics, you cannot you compromise yourself. So I think the key thing is that that was what triggered my, uh, my uh, wish to help. 
So there is a lot of scholarship. I mean, I have a few uh, ex-students or current students who came today who are here who I didn't know, but apparently uh, they're funded by uh, the scholarship that I uh, give. Um, I think it's very important. I think it's, it's lucky that, uh, that uh, they're brilliant enough to go abroad and uh, to find people. I mean, you shouldn't forget that the boss of uh, Imbev, uh, I mean, uh, Bud, Bud Weiser, Carlos Brito, got a scholarship from Paulo Lehman of $20,000 to go to uh, Stanford. Uh, in these days, he was an, an, an engineer in Brazil, got accepted to an MBA in Stanford, the, the Paulo Lehman gave him those $20,000. Today, he's the most brilliant CEO in the world, and they're buying a South African brewery. It will be the largest brewer in the world. And so helping a little bit allows huge benefits. And I think uh, AUB, Jamhu, USG, now you have LAU, uh, university, hospital. That's all what we have left in Lebanon to produce this... Uh, these uh, brilliant minds to let them flourish. So I think that's uh, that's uh, probably uh, why I'm doing it. Wonderful. So uh, I should give time, obviously, to the audience for questions. And we have two microphones over here. Who has the microphones? Okay, Cynthia has the microphones, and we would love everyone to participate, especially the young generation, and really learn from a master who had an incredible career here. He can answer you directly. Anybody has a microphone? Yes. Question? So give us your name, and then go ahead with the question. Who is it? OK, we have a. Hi. I'm Edmond Ramley. Uh, I'll start us off with, if you knew then what you know now, what would you have done differently in your life? That's a question that all of us ask every day to each other, to our wives or to our husbands. Would we have done things differently? And somehow, no. Uh, I started very early. I was in a rush. Uh, I would start everything again uh, at the same speed. Uh, and I don't think I would have done things differently. Maybe what has changed now compared to 20, 30, 30 years ago is that probably you have to be even more cautious. The tolerance, zero tolerance in our world has even come into all businesses. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, you were allowed to make one mistake in whatever job you had. Today, you have zero uh, tolerance. So I think you have to make sure that uh, one learns from whatever happens around in any business you have. But uh, no, I think uh, knowing more, knowing less, no, I think very early we were uh, plugged in. Uh, I don't know, maybe... Uh, I should look at my wife. Would I have done things differently? No, I think so. no. No, I think it's a, it's a, it's a. I think it's a, a blessing to know that you've done things the right way, because you cannot have any regrets, otherwise you missed it. Okay. Yes. Hi. Good evening, Jacques Maracade. Um, as a business school graduate, we learn a lot about networking. And as someone who's lived in London and the US now, you meet a lot of people. And one thing, one question that always comes up is our relationships, are about relationships and how you maintain relationships. And I was wondering if you had any advice about you know, how it is through everything you've been through, all the people you've met, all the people trying to keep in touch with you, how do you best keep hold of your friends and develop those relationships? Thank you. The question is very uh, important because you don't succeed out of school or university if you're the first in your class uh, only. You need to have a social uh, uh, intelligence. <coughs> social uh, intelligence is networking and uh, credibility. 
So I think uh, <clears throat> what's very important is that uh, in my school, a lot of uh, graduate students, or in my universities, a lot of uh, uh, honors list became very interesting people, but they struggled. Thank you. They struggled with time to go beyond a certain level. The networking helps you to get to know other people and to get to be known by other people. And uh, that didn't exist much in our MBA. When I did Columbia University in 1982, there was not much of the networking. This is something new. It's not enough, but you cannot succeed by just being a brilliant guy. You need something else. So I think it's complementary to whatever else you do well. It's a necessity. I mean, if you're a doctor and you don't have a good contact with your uh, patient, the patient uh, probably will be very concerned about uh, your diagnostic. And I mean, in uh, every job, and especially in finance, it's very important. So I think uh, networking is important as an additional quality that you need to succeed, I think. Hi, Philippe. Uh, Sarah Hajar. I wanted to ask you a question about um, a statement you made in the beginning of your, when, when we asked you about your career. You said you chose finance because most people weren't thinking about finance. And today, every opportunity is extremely saturated by a lot of competition and educated young people. So if you were to advise somebody to look for success in a specific sector or redefine what you would look for today, what would you say, which sector, how would you approach it differently? Uh, <clears throat> it uh, helps me think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> today, you need to be a specialist in whatever you do. To be specialized, you need to spend longer time. So even if you work for JP Morgan, don't, there is what I call the Lebanese itch. After a few years, you think you know more better than others. <laughs> Don't stay, continue to do what you do well. And only at age 35, 40, once you've worked for 10, 15 years, you start thinking of doing something else that you've always dreamt uh, to do. You know, if you're a consultant, you're an engineer, you're a financier. So uh, you have, you're lucky to have more tools than we had at your age. But uh, you will learn that you have to stay longer in what you do until you specialize and you become somebody very knowledgeable. So the advice to you is first, you need to do something that you like. And then once you like it, then you start choosing who you want to do it. Because at the beginning, you don't have that choice. You you're, have to do it with whoever is in the firm at, uh, where you work. So take time in everything you want to do but use your free time to move faster. Use the free time to learn more, to read more, to uh, connect uh, with more people so that you see what people who were ahead of you in the same job were doing so that you know what steps you need to follow. So uh, just take more time. You are lucky to be in part of those, the most brilliant banks in the world. It's complementary to your uh, education at university because you cannot, uh, university alone is not enough. The school, the school of work is even as important as the, the university. But take your time because it's, uh, it will, uh, you're dealing with very competent people, the, your very protected environment. And uh, once you're alone to the rest of the world to do what you like, you need to be very strong with your, uh, uh, wishes and your uh, thing. I mean, uh, so uh, enjoy the protected life that you have at uh, these banks as long as you can, because once you want to do something else, you're really left on your own, and you need a lot of. Uh, you need to be very strong and a lot of uh, experience. So uh, in finance today, in my days, it was a new a new job, so a new field. So it was much more diversified. Today, it's controlled by the big banks. But even those big banks, as you see, you cannot last. They call them too big to fail. So eventually, they will come back into smaller uh, outfits. And so that could give an opportunity for people within these big banks to find smaller outfits from which to grow. 
they cannot be an end by themselves, uh, all those large institutions. So uh, the world is an endless cycle. I mean, I give you an example. HSBC was a very large bank in fund management. Today, HSBC doesn't want to touch fund management because of uh, some reputational problem they had. So all the fund managers who were there have take left with their investors and go somewhere else and create a new outfit. So you can create growth out of uh, opportunities that come which you could not expect at the time. Yes? Am I up? Or? Hi. Thank you for being here, uh, Jennifer Shamas. Great example on HSBC. I work for HSBC. Um, <laughs> just wanted your opinions on, you know, we all are here part of the same heritage, and I wanted to know, in your opinion, to what degree should we keep, should we be in touch with that heritage, and how best should we contribute? What, by what means should we contribute to that heritage? And, you know, we see all these problems in Lebanon. We live here in a completely different world with different opportunities. And it's hard to keep connected. And I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's, uh, you will hear an answer that you don't want to hear. Whatever you hear that Lebanon is not doing well is the wrong. Uh, I was there last weekend. There were 400 people for an opening of a museum. Uh, there were curator, there was artist, uh, there were American people, and uh, the, you wouldn't hear, and we went to the Sursok Museum, we went to other places, you, it was safe, nobody got any problems, so uh, one should go, come and back, and not listen to the noise. Yes, there was a video about some garbage on the road when there was rain, we all saw that, but that's part of it, I mean, it, you have to deal with it, it's unfortunate, but you have to deal with that. I think uh, Lebanon, as Per Batou was saying, just by staying still is progressing because the rest of the Arab world is on a way collapsing. You know, uh, in art where we're uh, active, I mean, Syria and uh, Egypt were very big countries uh, a few years ago, and the, both of them have somehow disappeared from the art scene, and Lebanon has become a huge art scene. If you had told you 10 years ago that Lebanon will be big in museum, in art, in exhibitions, it's impossible. There is war all around. And somehow, art is the last thing you worry or you help once everything else is making sure that it works. So if we have time to look after art, meaning we have time to look after education, after refugees, after others, and that resiliency, and so each one of us should be involved. I mean, the heritage makes us stronger. The, you can be, you can go uh, anywhere you want in the world. You're always part of a place. Now it gets lost with the generation, but somehow if you're young enough to remember and to have lived it, don't forget it because it's very uh, important. And uh, uh, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, things you could help either with your free time or with your uh, success or with your knowledge. To, uh, there is a lot of need, there is a lot of success, there is a lot of requirement. The presence of uh, Per Batur and uh, his colleague and Anis uh, is very important because uh, it's an example, it's a living uh, example. In that school of the Beka Valley, uh, a young kid come, uh, came to see me, he was 18, uh, five, six years ago, and I was told, Philippe, can you help him? He wants to go to university. I said, OK, I will help him. I said, where, where do you want to go? He said, I was accepted at Polytechnique. I said, do you speak French? He said, I just learned. I said, Polytechnique? He said, yes. I said, OK, I will help you. He had taken the concours, and he went. The year after, I got his brother who comes and sees me. I said, where, where do you want to go? He said, oh, I'm accepted at Centrale. I said, wow. Uh, who are your parents? He said, they're teachers in uh, our schools. I mean, teachers paid, what, $1,000, $1,200, and they got two kids to Central and Polytechnique. So uh, this is what you can help. You know, you don't need a lot. You need a little bit, uh, either with your time, with your education, with the Teach for Lebanon, with that uh, Sharbel uh, Tajir is, uh, got involved and involving a lot of us. I think all these little things can help. It doesn't need to be, uh, you don't need to be uh, very uh, highly involved. You know, it's really at very small levels. There is a lot of stories like this out of Jamur, uh, who, uh, I mean, they have more students who go 
uh, everywhere in the world, uh, anywhere, than they used to have. It's not because uh, people are more brilliant. People are as smart as we always were, all of us, uh, before. But it's because they're more motivated and there is more uh, uh, resiliency to uh, more need to go further. I think uh, that's what you can do. Yes. There is a question in the front. <clears throat> Hi, uh, great, uh, great talk. Uh, my name is Dr. Moad. I, uh, we came from Washington, D.C., but I want to ask you a question that's going to benefit me financially. So, <laughs> so but seriously, uh, because we're with people who are very successful here, expat community, a lot of money. Now, we look at Lebanon, trash, dysfunctional government, no president, 1.5 million refugees, everybody's asking for money. As an expat, would you advise me to invest in Lebanon and buy? Because as I think Rockefeller said, where there's blood on the street, you should buy. But what is your projection of Lebanon in five years from now? Do you really think Lebanon can bring back the hedge fund, the private equity, the venture capitalists? Um, and would you advise me to buy? No, no, wait. He has to answer. <laughs> I need the new glass. Um, you can drink. Yes, thank you. <laughs> It reminds me of the doctor for the hallway consults from people, <laughs> where you say, I need to examine the patient to give the answer. But we want you to answer in the hallway without examining the patient. So these no, are but it's, it's a serious but question. That everybody, ahead. we all face that. I have two ways to answer. And we're all like uh, attached to Lebanon emotionally yes. more than anything else. I have two ways to answer. First, I can predict what the stock market will do tomorrow. I cannot predict what Lebanese politics will do tomorrow. <laughs> that's, that's the first point. Uh, uh, Lebanon, I have invested a lot in Lebanon. Uh, for the moment, it's very fragile, but it's there. If, if people would have told any one of us 10 years ago that within 10 years or five years, Syria would disappear and Lebanon would still be standing without one bullet being fired, I said, no, impossible. And somehow today, you have Lebanon, which is still there. Nobody wants to fight. Nobody, we, we had our war. Uh, a long time ago. Uh, yes, you always have people insulting other people, but it remains at that level. I mean, it's very small, it's petty, it's stupid, but this is how. But the, the individuals don't recognize them, themselves into these things. They want to live, they want to, it's uh, more important. Uh, the problem of Lebanon is that every, it needs 10 years, every country need, uh, Lebanon, a country Lebanon needs 10 years to produce a leader. We produced a lot of leaders, but we, had a lo we lost a lot of them. From uh, assassinated. Uh, from uh, Hariri <laughs> to Jumayel to a lot of very good people. You know, Hariri, I remember when he was prime minister, he imposed Suklin in one day. People, and there was a lot of people fight. I mean, I was young. I did not understand what was Suklin. I said, no, they take the mandate for the, for the trash, and that's it. Today, unfortunately, you, have, you need a consensus. The, the government is made of good people. I mean, from uh, the Prime Minister Salam to other people. I mean, we know half, uh, half of them, they are friends, you know. But the consensus decision is uh, impossible. The majority doesn't rule. You need uh, all of people to sign up. And you don't have a leader. So you're stuck in a way due to the, how the system has been uh, designed. It's, it's not the people who are wrong. I mean, you always have one or two. You can focus on one or two things, but the system has uh, probably is stuck. Uh, so uh, Lebanon, it really looks, it looks, it's when things look the worst that you have to look beyond. Uh, I don't know if people are right or wrong, but I think that uh, we could get closer to some solution in Syria. You raise the war level between Russia and others in order to What's negotiate a solution which they're trying Syrian now. I don't know. We never had so many meetings than lately between the different groups. So if that happens, then uh, I think Lebanon will be the, probably the place to rebuild because there is nothing in Syria. There is nothing left. You know, whether you're... Uh, so, uh, so that's the end. Yes, but, <laughs> yes, but partially, you know, partially. We learned that you cannot go too much or too big. A lot of people were disappointed. They went to Lebanon, got disappointed. So you need to hedge your bets or so. 
uh, not to go all in because the all in you can wait also. So it's uh, you need to have a measured bet. Thank you. Uh, hello, I want to thank you for your time tonight. By the way. Oh yeah, thank you very much for your time, and um, I'm over here for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Oscar, I'm a Columbia University undergrad, and I wanted to get your perspective on what you think some of the trends and the challenges that the hedge fund industry is facing or has faced or will face. Thank you. Uh, the hedge fund industry, biggest problem is the computers. Uh, today, a computer that doesn't sleep, doesn't get emotional, programmed with everything we know, and uh, same as a computer can beat a chess player, uh, it can also beat a hedge fund manager. So today you have huge swings coming out of uh, electronic trading and computer driven, and the alpha that the human mind can generate, meaning the added value that human mind can generate, we have to look for it at the higher level. So uh, we, as a business, to manage money, uh, Bridgewater, Ray Dalio, used to say three years ago, I mean, he manages 200 billion, we don't need any more fund managers, it's obsolete, a computer can do better. Until in September, when his fund dropped by 8%, so suddenly the traditional fund manager can do better than his computers. So you, it's a, the market, market lives in cycle, you have to identify your cycle, and as an individual, you have to identify where you're good at. And don't try to do what someone else does, uh, which you don't know, because you'll be left uh, drifting in the sea. So you need to focus, you need to have a specialty, you need to have a knowledge, and focus on that. It's like when you're a doctor. If you're a doctor, you can't be, have 100 specialties, you have only one. When you're a hedge fund, or when you're a fund manager, you have one specialty, stick to it, and do it very, very deeply. But to become a hedge fund, you really have to go through the various steps. You have to become an analyst, you have to become a manager, then you, it's only when you succeed and you're doing very well that you're on your own and you can become a private uh, equity or a hedge fund manager or others. So it requires a lot of uh, time and uh, knowledge and process. We'll take one more question. Yeah, sure, but you, you've yeah. seen the graph, we're not doing well, guys. We're 54,000 okay. only. I have it here. So, uh, Philippe. One, one, one second, Cheryl. So, I really think that we should be ashamed to have this number. I, I think tonight. that chart is wrong, by the way. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure that chart is wrong. We have more. So, if, who, have, who, has, who has envelopes? No. Show me your envelopes. I have three people who are getting the envelopes, please. Let's be proud of our crowd tonight. Envelopes. Wood. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Sheb. So, uh, Philip, you touched. You touched a little bit tonight on uh, what you do with scholarships. Um, I think there's, from what I know, there's a lot more that you do out there. <clears throat> if you don't mind putting your modesty aside a little bit, tell us a little bit about the uh, Philippe Jab Foundation and the scholarships that you do and th the kinds of things that you do because um, this should be an example to, to everybody. Uh, probably, okay, uh, people in my uh, position act but don't talk, but here I have to talk. So uh, uh, I think that we have to give back, I mean, we learned it from this country, that you have to give back to society where you come from, the university calling you at eight o'clock at night on Sunday, uh, Jamhur never called. So we had to go to Jamhur. I'm president of the Mutuelle of Jamhur because 
I voluntarily give them without them coming to ask. I mean, now we have Per Batur, he's here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think there is not this uh, intensity of department. So uh, helping schools is fine, helping institution, convent, churches, I mean, uh, hos uh, hospitals, uh, art, universities is one uh, aspect. Medical help is another aspect. If you know in Lebanon, you, uh, the government, the country, the government pays 90% of your uh, operation when you need a, sur a surgery, and a lot of people don't have the 10% the 10 left. So for $100, you help a guy have an operation for $1,000. So all these little things add up, but more importantly is uh, education. I have set up a structure 15 years ago where I have a lot of, edu I mean, when I started the AUB, used to give $2 million a year of donation and scholarship for their uh, undergrad. Today, they have $26 million to give, thanks to a lot of donors. So today, the need have gone not to the undergrad, but to the graduate. Because when you go out of EUB, you want to go to do a master in America or in France or in England, it costs a lot of money, and there is no structure to help. And the university don't help. The university abroad uh, help the uh, uh, undergrad on a need-blind policy, but not the graduate student. It's quite rare. So uh, I have created, uh, I have focused even more, instead of, grad of that of uh, undergrad, it's graduate. So I have around, uh, uh, you know, out of 300 uh, university students, half of them abroad, half of them in Lebanon, helping, you know, the guy who wants a little bit more, more. I mean, I give you an extraordinary story. One of my, there was a young student who got out of, uh, Louise Wegman, uh, 10 years ago, and he, uh, he uh, was not, you know, first in the lycée, and in, in the Bac Francais. So I told him, where are you going? He said, AUB gave me a scholarship. I told him, that university in America where I want to go to do pre-med. I said, I'll help you go to pre-med. He said, what do I owe you for that? I said, nothing, just do your pre-med. After five years, he got a full scholarship at Harvard uh, Medical School. And the guy is brilliant. I mean, maybe he would have got that out of AUB, but less. So allowing brilliant people to flourish, I think, is very important. I have a lot of cases like this. So, you know, uh, I don't know if those are the cases you want me to talk about, but you know, you have Polytechnic, you have Central, you have Harvard, you have, it's extraordinary the number of uh, alumni. I have an alumni of 1,500 students now, and it's extraordinary uh, uh, where they end up and where they meet, and the astrophysicians, the physicians, the doctors. The only thing I have to limit are the doctors. <laughs> because they're, they're, I told them, look, not more than 25% doctors, please. Because, You're right. Because they take a very long time. There's a lot of them. <laughs> and, and for the diversity of Lebanon, they help less. If you have too many doctors, they disappear in Texas, in uh, Iowa, in Arizona. And you don't see them back in Lebanon. I mean, a lot of my class of Jamhur very rarely come back to Lebanon. I sent 20 mails to my 77 Jamhur with Anis Baraka to get them to come here. And they come from all over America. No, they, maybe one or two have showed up, but, not, uh, the, but out of the other, they don't. They're, they get lost in the system, in the network, in their life, in their work. So I think uh, diversity, focus, and, uh, and uh, long-term thinking, I think, is what uh, is helpful. So I uh, hope it will uh, trigger a lot more uh, spontaneous feeling. And this is why life was very important. You know, the Lebanese in finance, where uh, a few people here are involved, also was very important to help, to connect, to help, to help students and the graduate in finance and in other fields. So I think uh, all of us can do jointly or individually, or uh, I know that, uh, you know, with Ray uh, the Bani also we have some uh, projects that we helped in Jamhur also in the past, each one of us helping from room. I mean, it's, it's, there is a lot to we can be done, but we don't, uh, the only one who talk about it are the people who receive it, because we, we don't, uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's it. Okay. So we're going to close the questions. Thank Philippe, thank you so much to, to be with us, to be so open. <laughs>